Now let's be honest. If muscle was easy to replicate, we probably would not be here today. I mean, muscle is a super complex structure made up of a number of tissues. We have skeletal muscle tissue, we have nerve tissue, we have connective tissue, we have vascular tissue. Muscle also portrays some crucial structural characteristics, such as the alignment of skeletal muscle cells, or these aligned muscle fibers. Now, in order to better understand muscle cells, or cells in general, we routinely culture them in these flat, smooth, stiff petri dish. This then, by oversimplifying the environment, the cell, the cells appear randomly scattered, <coughs> they're flatter, and they fail to differentiate into this nice striated or banded myotubes or muscle fibers. Now for those of you who have never seen cells under the microscope, this is roughly what they look like. So they appear as these like elongated structures, they begin to move around, and they eventually find that head to tail conformation and then they begin to fuse. Now in order to address the issue of alignment, a number of groups have shown that we can use these pattern substrates. So these substrates that are made up of nano or micro grooves will cause the cells to elongate parallel to the grooves or along the grooves, as opposed to cells that are just placed on these smooth substrates, which appear uniform or round. Now it has been shown that there's even a difference in gene expression between cells that are aligned and those that are not. Now, these substrates have been super useful in our understanding of alignment and the importance of alignment. But they do require specialized equipment and they are labor intensive as well. And if we're thinking food, these things are all, for the most part, made out of glass or plastic. A couple of years ago, the Pellin lab showed that we could use a piece of the cellularized apple to, as a, as a three-dimensional scaffold for cell culture. So they actually shaped it into an ear, and that's what you see up there. So that was then followed by a number of other groups. They also showed how we can use other types of plants in cell culture. Now the abundance, biocompatibility, animal free nature, relative low cost of these substrates or of, of plant tissue makes them a very promising scaffolding material for cell eggs. So one day I was, I was thinking, I was like, okay, I need to, I was thinking about my thesis and the purpose of my research, which was to figure out the potential applications of these cellularized plant tissue in cell eggs. So I was thinking, I said, okay, so I went grocery shopping for biomaterials, as one does. And I was thinking, I said, okay, well, what plants or mushrooms, or sorry, what plants or mushrooms, yes, resemble or have a meaty texture? And things like oyster mushrooms, you have uh, portobello, you have jackfruit. But one of the things that we got really interested in was celery. I hardly think of why celery. Well, we, we thought, we're like, okay, it's got, it had a really nice fiber structure. And it always gets stuck to your teeth, so how is that a bad thing? <laughs> so when I started looking at it, I started looking at it under the microscope, and I realized that the vascularization of celery was actually made up of these like really small vessels, which you can see on the top right. So I asked myself, I said, okay, can we slice a celery stalk longitudinally, as you can see on the image, and go from these vessels to groups? So that's what it shows. So we kind of slice it, we get those groups on the bottom right. And the nice green strip that you see going across the screen that I'm showing you, it's actually the vascular bundle that has been cut longitudinally. And yes, if you look closely, I'm wearing my Ginkgo shirt. Big fan. <laughs> so, when we looked at that closely under the microscope, oh, sorry, too early. When we looked at that closely under the microscope, we can see that we now created these nice pattern 
or these, these micro groups. When we measure these groups, we realize that the diameter was somewhere between 20 to about 40 micrometers in, in diameter. Which, and interestingly enough, that was actually in the range necessary to induce optimal alignment and differentiation of muscle cells. So, you'll remember this picture, right? That I showed earlier, that if we place cells in these pattern substrates, they will align. So we started thinking, we said, hypothesize that if we then place cells on this, where's my piece of celery? I did bring a piece of celery with me. If we <laughs> put cells on that vascular bundle or on these grooves that we just created, we hypothesize that the cells will align parallel to the vascular bundle. And not only will the cells align, but we then expect them to also fuse and form myotubes or these multinucleated structures, these like baby muscle fibers. So, first thing I wanted to do was to figure out the orientation of the vascular bundle. And what you can see behind me is actually the vascular bundle that has been labeled with a fluorescent dye in order to kind of isolate it. And you can see that it's going horizontally. Now you might be wondering what exactly is all this? Well, that nice kind of helical structure that you see on the bottom, that's actually part of the xylem. So the, the vascularization of plants is mostly made up of phloem and xylem. Now I have to be honest. When I look at stuff like this under the microscope, I get paid. I love it. Because, I mean, to think that something this simple is actually that complex, to me, it's incredible. So we started thinking. We said, OK, so we now know the orientation of the vascular bundle. So it's going horizontally, zero degrees, perfect. Then we place cells skeletal muscle cells. We culture these cells for 10 days in growth media in order to let them adhere, kind of move around, align. And then on day 10, we label them. We label the actin, which corresponds to the cytoskeleton, and the nuclei. And as you can see, the long axis of the nuclei, or the apex, and the actin filament are actually aligned parallel to the vascular bundle. So the next thing I wanted to do is, OK, great. Now, what happens if we induce differentiation? Will we get nicely aligned myotubes? So we come back. First thing, find the vascular bundle, figure out its orientation. And as you can see behind me, so it's going across once again horizontally. We repeat our experiment. So we place the cells in this growth media for 10 days. And then we place them in a low serum environment in order to induce that kind of fusion event or differentiation. And on day five, we label uh, an early differentiation marker, which is the myosin heavy chain. And we also label the nuclei. And once again, you can see that now these myotubes have also aligned parallel to the vascular bundle. These like baby muscle fibers have formed along the vascular bundle. The next thing I wanted to do now is just quantify our data in order to compare. So we used an image processing algorithm to analyze the particles and figure out the orientation of, of those particles analyzed. And it gives us this nice histogram which has a clear peak, peak at zero degrees. Which is pretty much telling us that the particles analyzed, which in this case are the green particles, are most of them are roughly at around six to uh, zero degrees, which is what, what we see on the screen. So they're going horizontally. So the next question then was, can we then, what happens when we culture cells outside of the vascular bundle? So on the non-vascularized tissue. So this is kind of the, what 90% of the celery would look like under the microscope. So we labeled the plant cell walls with this fluorescent dye, with the exact same fluorescent dye that we used in the previous images. We repeated our experiments, so we cultured the cells for 10 days, we differentiated the cells for five, <laughs> and you can see, for the most part, the myotubes appear somewhat randomly scattered. 
We use the exact same image processing algorithm to compare, and we get a relatively flat histogram. So I just pretty much showed you how we can use this simple piece of celery to recreate something as complex as cellular alignment. But let's remember this. Let's go back to the first slide and remember this. The only thing I discussed today was alignment. And alignment is only one crucial characteristic of muscle. There's still a number of cell types that we need to introduce. A piece of celery, believe it or not, is actually a foreign matrix to cells. And there's still a number of biochemical and physical stimuli that we need to include in order to make it in vivo-like. So don't get me wrong, plants are pretty incredible. I mean, they already come vascularized, they're abundant, low cost, biocompatible, they're 3D, so that's a huge deal. But there's still a number of things we still we need to address. Let's remember one last thing before I move on to my last, uh, last slide. The scientific method relies on concrete incremental steps, and this is one of those one of those baby steps. So before we actually turn my celery to the scaffold in, but still there's also a number of things we need to address here before we get to that burger. We need to overcome our dependence on FPS, antibiotics, and we need to figure out how we're gonna scale this thing. But good thing Scott is up next. No pressure. So I want you to walk away with these two things. One, celery is awesome. <laughs> and two, if muscle was easy to replicate, we probably would not be here today. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>